Hello, Mo, and welcome to Bonding Intermolecular Forces. Before we get into intermolecular forces, we need to re review the idea of intermolecular bonding. The forces within a molecule due to shared electrons or electrostatic forces are bonds. Okay, so when we say molecule, sometimes we say it liberally. We're talking about ionic compounds, covalent compounds. The forces between them that hold them together are bonds. Electrostatic ion-ion forces hold ions together in an ionic bond. If you drop that ionic compound like sodium chloride into water, you get what's called an ion-dipole bond, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Covalent bonds hold atoms together in a covalent compound. Okay, that's like water being held together by these covalent bonds. Okay, Inter intermolecular forces are attractions between different molecules in a sample of a mo uh, in a sample. And this is going to be for covalent compounds only. Intermolecular forces uh, are the evidence we have for changes in our intermolecular forces are changes in phase of matter, like ice melting, things vaporizing, things freezing, things uh, melting, condensing. Those are changes in the forces between uh, particles in a, a sample of a covalent compound. And if you look at this graphic down at the bottom, this is a really valuable graphic. This shows us the energies and the strengths of intermolecular forces when compared to intramolecular forces. Ion-ion forces between two ions in a bond are here, okay? Covalent bonds are here. These are intramolecular forces. Let's draw a line here. There is no line, but there's a line, okay? If you look at what we're about to talk about, that's this region here, okay? So we'll come back to this graphic soon. The first type of intermolecular force we need to discuss is called the dipole-dipole force. This is when you have a molecule that we consider polar, and we take a, a pure sample of it, and we and assess the attractive forces between the different parts of the molecule. We already know how water behaves. We know that water molecules attach to other water molecules in a way that, um, that uh, they connect together well. Well, water doesn't fit this description. It's got a different type. Something like hydrochloric acid is better. Hydrochloric acid is a dipole, okay? It's got a negative part and a positive part. We could have also drawn the arrow, if you recall the arrow from an earlier lecture. Um, and what happens is the negative portions of one molecule are attracted to the positive part of another molecule, and that creates this weak force called a dipole-dipole attraction. Um, approximately 10% as strong as a covalent bond. So this covalent bond here is about 10 times stronger than this here. Okay, so these interactions are what allow hydrochlor uh, hydrogen chloride, which is a precursor to hydrochloric acid once you get it in water, that allow it to separate and form vapors very easily. Um, in a sample of hydrogen chloride, we would expect these molecules to orient themselves to minimize repulsion and maximize attractions. Um, the more polar this bond is, the more attraction there is between different particles of the, of the same compound. It doesn't matter what size they are. Um, these are uh, polar molecules, okay? You would, of course, draw this and decide the, the particle was polar before you decided that the, the, the most common intermolecular force among a sample of it would be dipole-dipole force. So you would have to decide for yourself if it were polar in a hypothetical question about this kind of topic. A special kind of dipole-dipole force is called the hydrogen bond, and this is where water uh, features, okay? Hydrogen bonding is the strongest intermolecular force. Uh, it's unusually strong when compared to other dipole-dipole um, bonding. And it only happens in um, atoms where you have hydrogen covalently bound to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. And in water, it's that bond, that oxygen-hydrogen bond that makes it very polar, hydrogen being very small, making this a very strong attraction. These dotted lines here are the hydrogen bond. There are two reasons for the strength of the hydrogen bond. One, hydrogen is really small. It can go in small spaces, so it can attract to a lot of different things. And also the very large polarity across this bond and the presence of their two, presence of two, two of them being there in the molecule is also a factor. It's not really listed there. Um, substances with strong hydrogen bonding have high boiling points compared to similar substances. Very common substances, ammonia and water, and hydrofluoric acid all undergo hydrogen bonding in pure samples. But any molecule where this R represents some end of the molecule that's random, it doesn't mean random, but we'll say it's random for now, where you see a nitrogen-hydrogen bond at, the, at, at an outer edge of the molecule, same is true of a random particle that contains a hydrogen bond to an oxygen on the edge of the mo uh, molecule, 
So we see that we have m many possibilities, not just these three pure samples, but also these other potentials and lots of different types of molecules can have hydrogen bonding due to the presence of bonds like these. And the reason is because despite what the rest of this molecule may have, this hydrogen oxygen complex is going to be attracted to similar hydrogen on, uh, oxygen complexes in a different molecule. So the third type is London dispersion forces. Um, London dispersion forces are a very, very weak force that exists in all matter, but they're only notable when there's no other IMF present. So um, London dispersion forces occur because of momentary electron imbalances in a molecule or atom. Um, when one of these momentary imbalances happens, what it means is, let's say M is our molecule and say it's got four electrons. If at any one moment all four electrons just happen to be on this side of the molecule, just for that moment we have a brief momentary dipole where we have a negative charge where the electrons are and a positive charge where the electrons are not. And so what this will very briefly do is if it encounters another atom or molecule, it will induce a dipole on a nearby atom. And so you can get a momentary dipole that exists between a few particles, momentary attraction. The thing is, just as quickly as that happens, is it, it unhappens when the electrons move again. Um, and so understanding this uh, in kind of in an abstract way, you're thinking about these molecules briefly attracting if there are anything nearby to attract to. Um, this is called a polarization, okay? Normally, this molecule is not polar. This is a brief polarization of the molecule. Now, in isolation, this is a very weak force, okay? Just one singular LDF is very weak. Um, and in, because of it, it also explains the low freezing point of, of nonpolar gases, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But when you collect a whole lot of them, they can actually make substances that are solid. So let's talk about that. The more electrons a molecule has, the greater probability of polarization will occur and cause induced dipoles nearby. Remember, smaller mass means greater velocity for gas molecules, thus less interaction and less chance of induced dipoles. It's almost impossible to freeze helium. Here's your nonpolar gas. Um, it's less than one Kelvin uh, is the freezing point of helium. So it's kind of important to understand that is, when you start to have something that naturally has very little attraction and very large velocity, that freezing it is extremely difficult to do because the only force that can potentially hold these things together are London dispersion forces. Let's talk about wax though. Wax is a nonpolar solid, but wax has a very long carbon chain, okay? The carbon chain um, long enough that there's enough, molecule, enough, enough atoms and electrons in the molecule that we have a brief attraction sufficient to make it a solid, okay? Um, some examples of, of nonpolar gases, uh, we have a, a, a methane, oxygen, this would not be a gas, this would probably be a solid. We have a, nit a nitrogen gas and helium gas. IMF strength is a function of IMF type, in other words, if it's a polar molecule or not, and the mass of the particle, okay? The more polar and massy molecule is, the stronger the IMFs and the more likely it's liquid or solid. And so I have you for you five examples. Sugar, with a relatively large mass, is polar, um, and it is a solid. We, we know what sugar looks like at room temperature. Wax is 20 to 30 carbons long, at least. It is nonpolar, but has a large enough mass to make it a solid at room temperature. Food oils can be anywhere from 15 to 25 carbons long or nonpolar with moderate mass, usually liquid at room temperature. Water is very polar with a small mass. Um, but because it's so polar, it's a liquid at room temperature. This is, water is very unique, very important. We, we understand that it is unique that a, something with a molar mass of 18 can ha be a liquid uh, under normal circumstances. Nitrogen has a relatively similar mass to water, a little bit larger even, um, but since it's nonpolar, it's a gas. So we're jumping into bond energy, and then we will be done with this unit. Um, Bond length and bond energy, two very important topics we just need to touch on. Um, so far, we talked about why atoms bond. They do so to, become, to lower their potential energy and to become more stable, okay? And this is what this is about. Um, potential energy is based on the position of objects. This is where force of attraction and force of repulsion are balanced. A molecule is stable. Um, the lower the potential energy in a molecule, the more stable it is. So we're going to talk about the hydrogen-hydrogen bond and look at a graph of it in a moment. But I want to draw just to make sure we're clear on what we mean by attractive and repulsive forces. So in an atom, and these are just rudimentary drawings. These are not eyeballs looking at you. Uh, the nucleus is positively charged. And so we can expect a fair amount of repulsion between nuclei. Okay. Electrons, though, are negatively charged. We can expect that they might repel each other. Okay, so... 
we have a fair amount of repulsion there. But in addition to the repulsions we see, we also have attractive forces. So this is where we start to see the balance come forward. Between electrons and the nuclei, we have attraction. So that attractive and repulsive set of forces balance out at a perfect distance given the diameter of the uh, nuclei in the, in, the, in the bond and given the force of attraction in the nucleus. So we, for hydrogen, know the bond length is about 74 picometers, which is extremely small. The hydrogen-hydrogen bond, when assessed from not a bond yet to way too close together, has a perfect Goldilocks zone, for lack of a better word, of bond length. And here's that 74 picometers again. And so what we see is when there's no attraction or repulsion at all, there is virtually zero uh, energy difference. This is the energy uh, of the two independent particles, okay? But as they come closer together, the force of attraction is releasing energy, okay? Them coming together is releasing energy, and they reach a point where that energy is maximal, and that ends up being their bond length, okay? In order to break the bond, you would have to contribute this much energy to break the bond. Notice I'm saying that to make this bond, energy is released. All right, so bond making releases energy. We're going to have to suspend disbelief from biology lecture for a minute. This is true of all chemistry. Making a new bond releases energy. Breaking bonds costs energy. Okay, so, and that's expressed right here. Take your time and pause this and read it, please. Remember from the second slide we did on this, in this uh, set of videos, atoms bind to reduce potential energy. Here we go. It went from effectively zero to negative 432 kilojoules per mole between the two uh, hydrogen atoms coming together. They are more stable together than they are apart. That's the way to think about it. Bond energy is the energy required to break a chemical bond. It's also the energy released when you uh, form a chemical bond. It's reported um, in kilojoules per mole, and it's done, um, reported for the breaking of one mole of bonds in an isolated molecule in the gaseous state. Now, this is nothing to memorize, but this is just FYI how it gets calculated. And the last thing I want to leave you with is just this graphic where you can compare bond links versus bond energy. And it's done in a lot of ways. You see some diatomic molecules. You see carbon-based molecules. You see hydrogen-based molecules. And you see carbon singly, triply, doubly, and triply bound. And there's a lot to, to, to take in. But what it shows you is that singular bonds tend to be of lower energy and with a larger length than double and triple bonds. But what we learned in the uh, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory and the hybridization is that single uh, bonds, a double bond is not twice the energy of a, a single bond. It's a lot more, but it's not double. And a triple bond is not three times the energy of a single bond. So this sort of helps us understand the idea that pi bonds are strong, but they're not, but they're not that strong. Um, if you look between uh, uh, oxygen and diatomic, or sorry, an oxygen oxygen bond and a double bond, it's actually more than double for different reasons. And so there's other factors at play here. Um, when we look at uh, the comparison between the different diatomic molecules, pay attention to the bond length compared to the energy and just make some associations for yourself. This concludes bonding five, intermolecular forces, bond energy, and bond length. You should have taken high quality notes. Please rewatch this video as needed. We know you have questions, so we'll see you in class with those.